your 2013 book, Austerity, The History of a Dangerous Idea is, I mean, it's been hugely informative to me. I think it's the best book written about that crisis. But if I understood your argument then correctly, it's that the 0708 crisis was fairly typical of manias, panics, and crashes, that people bid up the value of a bunch of assets. They then base their economic behavior on this hugely inflated value of assets. And um, once confidence in the value of those assets just eroded very quickly, the whole system collapsed. And there's a kind of a stigma that certain cultures and countries attach to that kind of behavior, you know, that whether it was homeowners who borrowed too much money or the banks who pushed too much money on them, the, the attitude was people made mistakes, they've got to pay the price, hence austerity. But, but this crisis seems like something different. Nobody did anything wrong. It's just a, an act of, I don't know, you know, faith, an act of God, whatever we say, but it's a, this deus ex machina came in and froze up the economy. So wouldn't that, doesn't that mean the present is different? I mean, is that why we're not hearing about austerity today? That's part of it, absolutely. Another way to think about it is in terms of the way that countries have responded to the virus shock. And that tells us a lot about how they're going to respond to this economically over the longer term. So let's be very brief. You're a China expert, so correct me how wrong I am in what I'm about to say. But the way that China responded to this was essentially command and control. When you have millions of people who are Communist Party members who can act with the authority of the state, you can sequester their entire neighborhoods and get food delivery organized. You can also put money through state-owned enterprises, get the banks to lend directly to who you want them to. You've got capital controls that other economies don't have. You have a certain growth model which allows you to buffer the shocks in a certain way. Then you get to Western Europe. Western Europe has long been trade dependent and something that economists observe for a long time is that the more open you are to trade, the bigger the welfare state you have because it's in a sense a giant shock absorber. So if you're in Denmark, you pay huge amounts of taxes. And at times like this, that means that you get a huge amount of consumption maintenance through those institutions. So there's a different way of cushioning the shock. One's a welfare state, one's a command and control state. When you get to the United States, it's very different. The United States growth model is basically optimized to run with no buffers. The basic idea, going back to the financial crisis, which showed it last time, is that the economy takes a shock, you protect the financial assets, you then allow the economy to adjust through wages and prices. In other words, price declines and unemployment. And the idea is that type of short, sharp shock allows the economy to come back without massive amounts of taxation or state intervention, etc. It's painful, but it tends to work. This type of crisis is not good for that type of model. Because whereas China has certain ways of controlling this simply because it is a very large, powerful state that can control in, in, in a classical sort of um, state-oriented way, and the Europeans have lots of different types of welfare institutions they can use to buffer shocks, everything from short working time to liquidity for companies through to direct cash transfer payments. In the United States, we're not really built for that. Getting a couple of checks in the mail for a couple of months to bail you over works on the assumption that this will be over in a couple of months. But if it's not over in a couple of months, that becomes very difficult for this type of economy in particular.